Hi everyone, how are you? Welcome to our, and I've lost the number count of how many, I think this is video number or webinar number six. Um, today we're going to be looking at um, lessons with fluent readers, so guided reading with fluent readers. So welcome and I hope everybody's doing well on this. Uh, this is my third week, um, so I don't know how many weeks it is for everybody who's watching, but the third week of being at home and um, Pat and I were just having the conversation about the um, angst of going to the grocery store. Um, so uh, anyway, so let, let's get on with this and hope everybody's doing well. So let me share my screen. Um, let's see, Dis host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and Pat, I think you've disabled me as well. Um, Cause I'm clicking on share and it's not allowing me. So Pat, can you help me with sharing here? Okay, so now I'm the host. Oh, there we go. All right, so I'll share my computer sound, optimize for full screen and share. All right, so let me take this up to our full screen presentation. And here we go. So today we're going to be thinking about lessons with fluent readers, what that looks like in grades two through five. So this would be for your kiddos in second grade who are reading beyond the grade level, um, as well as um, looking at maybe around that third grade um, uh, reading stages um, all the way up. So here we go in and we'll take a look at um, um, the reading development chart. So if you don't have that reading development chart, you'll need that again for today because I've really based so much around this. Um, one of the questions that someone shared with me um, was about thinking about how do you know what to teach when you're in guided reading or how do you know what to look for when you're in guided reading? And that's what this reading development chart is designed to do. It supports you to think about the kind of reading behaviors that children will be developing along a continuum. Um, and then the books are created in order to support that development. So when you're looking at a book in a particular reading stage or reading level, or excuse me, reading level with the books, um, it would be to develop these various behaviors that are here. Um, so the webinar series, we are, um, are fluent two to five. Tomorrow afternoon, we'll also have our advanced three to five. These, um, there is overlap in all of these from the reading stages. So I did use a, a format, but the, um, the videos and the uh, examples and things are different in every single one of these webinars. So um, if you can join us again for tomorrow. Um, so one of the things just to know if you're a uh, teacher who's, you know, or a principal or someone who's viewing all of these, um, we are going to be creating one additional one um, to look at kids who are in those very early stages of um, emergent or those early emergent lear learners. Um, as soon as I can get video or get um, uh, get permission slips because this is the tricky thing when everybody's home is getting permission slips from the kids. Um, and then if there's other topics and things about webinars that you would like webinars um, to think with you about, please send Pat an email at pat at myocopy.com and we'll put some of those together. So this agenda for today um, is thinking about what guided reading lesson design looks like when you're talking about fluent readers, um, thinking more about how teachers facilitate during a guided reading lesson, and then what happens after we read the book in guided reading. So just a little bit of a review, looking back at the defining guided reading uh, work that we did in our very first session together, thinking that guided reading is students with the support of the teacher reading, thinking, and talking their way purposefully through a text where they are applying strategies that they already know in an unfamiliar text, doing that independently with success. So putting all of that definition together, thinking about the work that kids are doing as they are in this flu these fluent stages. So today we're going to focus on kids who are reading in these in this early fluent stage, fluent and fluent plus. So thinking about from the kind of end of first grade, beginning of second grade, all the way through the end of third grade, if you were looking at these in relation to grade level. So thinking about the text that, that you're going to be reading with, or the kids are going to be reading when they're at these stages. Um, this IJ um, 
early fluence uh, stage of breeding, you're going to see kids that are going to, at this point, really be looking at this full variety of text types. So when you get into, um, into these kinds of levels, um, it really necessitates that kids are reading with fluency and comprehension around a real variety of books, um, fiction and nonfiction. The um, fiction texts are going to have really rich storylines, um, really uh, lots of character development through them and lots of meaningful events and, with, uh, and, and settings that really impact that storyline. They're also going to be removed um, from children's uh, personal experiences. So when we're in a book like Gasari's Herd, it's going to be the kind of book that, that supports kids to see that they can use what they know about how characters might be feeling or thinking to understand the book, but it's not going to necessarily be, you know, that personal experience that um, that that is there um, for the kids. And in nonfiction, there's going to be a variety of topics begin to appear uh, that real mix of text types, um, even within the same book. So, um, it, for example, in this book, um, uh, To the Rescue. It looks at different types of uh, helpers and first responders, but it also includes not only this informational kind of text, um, but it also includes biographical information as well. Um, the, this supports kids as they are thinking about the different ways that meanings are conveyed and the variety of text types um, also offers the opportunity to have a variety of text features be included as well. Um, and so in this um, opportunity uh, arises for kids to extract information from the informational passages um, using not only the, um, the running text, but also all of the graphics um, and thinking about how to integrate all that information together to build meaning across the text. Um, these books are chapter books now, they're longer, and kids are going to have to use things like chapter headings to help them prepare for reading, you know, table of contents and nonfiction to help them think about, um, uh, you know, getting themselves ready to sustain that reading on longer and more complex texts. Um, one of the um, other things that starts happening in these fluent stages is that the kids are really um, running into this real variety of text features because as you move up in levels in fiction, the illustrations fade out. They, they fade out in, and are just you know, an enhancement of the story. Whereas in nonfiction, as you move up in these stages, uh, or excuse me, in these levels, the, um, the features become more complex, you see more of them on particular pages, and the, the students really have to um, uh, use those texts and really integrate the ideas to support their reading um, as they're reading about these text topics that are um, about the world and how the, the world works. Um, within the range, within a single text, they're going to also start seeing, a, you know, sometimes a range of genre again. Um, the genre, you know, of reports and explanations and that kind of work. And that really requires them to consider how the genre and the text type um, supports them as readers as they use that, their, their knowledge about text types to help them to anticipate and organize the um, information that's going to be coming in the text. Um, when they're in fiction, these, um, you know, noticing how character and setting and plot connect are going to help them as they're thinking about these different types of storylines and thinking about characters over time and, you know, looking and, and having to use what they know about how characters are revealed in a story through what they say and what they do to help them understand, you know, the motivation of a character and um, why they do what they do. Um, one of the other things that is expected in, these, uh, reading, in this reading stage is that children are able to think about the author's point of view. So one of the things that they begin to see is thinking about different ways that author's points of view are revealed. And that could be through the variety of topics or the language that the author's using, the features, um, um, the photographs that are chosen, that kind of information. Then as they move into um, these Fluent Plus levels, um, you know, these are, are these solidly third grade um, levels of text. And here they're going to be thinking again about the range of features and the variety of text features that are there that will strengthen their abilities to be able to use that genre um, uh, to uh, anticipate and organize their thinking because there's going to be a lot of information in these texts. They're much longer 
um, than the text that they've been running into in other um, reading stages. Um, and so one of the things that, that starts happening in, in um, especially in these books, is that the kids are really expected to attend to the text language, things like phrases and clauses and word choices um, to help them understand the uh, relationship between different ideas that are, that are there in the text. Um, for example, here in the text that's on the left, um, this is from Amazing Salamanders. And one of the things that you're going to see a little bit later in the video is how sometimes the language cues just kind of blow right past the kids and they're not um, focusing so much in. Um, this particular uh, text um, asks, it's, makes a statement. It says, all salamanders breathe air to get oxygen into their bodies. There are four different ways that salamanders do this. And one of the things that we want kids to do is to recognize that when that kind of statement appears, that your brain would be ready to recognize, okay, I'm supposed to figure out what those four different kinds are from what the author is providing me. Um, and you'll see in the video that, that the kids I'm working with, this kind of goes right over their heads. Um, another thing you begin to see is that um, kids are having to deal with a lot of very content specific vocabulary in these texts. And so they've got to really understand different ways that authors provide um, definitions and a lot of that comes through language so it's not going to be necessarily running to a glossary or to the dictionary but really understanding that when a text says something like um, um, the wind blows embers and burning pieces of plants ahead of the fire which can start new blazes called spot fires and we think that language should register but because of the lexical density the number of ideas that are in a particular sentence sometimes by the time kids are getting to the end of a sentence they're not recognizing you know that the phrase is called um, is a way that an author signals that they're giving a definition and so one of the things that that we would expect to see in these levels is by the time kids are reaching here that they're adjusting their reading um, or the text type that they're in, recognizing that they're going to be slowing down on nonfiction, and that's that's a good thing. Um, if kids are reading um, with fluency and 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 as quickly in nonfiction as they're reading in fiction, then we know that they're probably not adjusting for the text type, and that may be something that we have to support them on. So as kids are encountering these kinds of texts and these kinds of, of um, uh, expectations for them as readers. We just have to make sure that they understand that every literacy act that they do, that they're involved in, has to involve comprehension. It's, it's understanding. That is what reading is. And so let's think a little bit about the lesson design that supports kids to do this kind of work. So in guided reading, there will always be an introduction to the text. One of the things that we know is that that's, that's kind of that piece that is um, that makes this text not just an independent reading. So in our introduction with fluent readers, one of the things that we have to do is set up the talk work so that kids are collaborating well, setting up the reading work, you know, what is the reading work that we're taking on um, as we're reading in, in this text, and then how we're orienting the kids to ideas in the book. Um, there may be some kinds of book walks through, um, but typically by this time kids are doing that kind of work on their own then there'll be the reading and discussing portion so this is when we are reading parts of the text and thinking about what that text means and having conversations and the kids are doing the reading independently and silently so there wouldn't be kids reading out loud here um, in these especially in these stages so the kids would be reading silently and much of the reading will take place in the guided reading lesson, but for some children and some texts, there may be some reading that begins to occur away from um, the, the guided reading group itself. And then there's that closure. And if you've been with me in any of these um, other webinars, or if you have worked with me live and in person, one of the things that I'm always talking about these days is making sure that we have that closure in a lesson that we are taking a moment before we send kids away from the group to reflect on the reading work and the talk work that we have done together um, that helped us to get to the meanings that are there. Um, one of the things we know is that when kids stop and they reflect, they're more likely to be able to take that learning into other places with them. So let's watch some of this in action. So the kids you're going to see today, um, it's a new group of readers. So these um, third graders had been working together 
um, for um, a week at the time when you see this video today. So I worked with them for a week and then we began to, um, to come together. So to my left, you see Zayden, who is a very strong thinker. He's got a lot of background knowledge. He's one of those readers who's, or those kids that you love having because he does, he just, he's so curious about things and he's very excited about reading. Next to him um, is Aisha, who is very confident and very thoughtful about the thinking that she puts out. Um, next to her is Naira, um, and Naira is also a strong thinker and is very confident at coming in to explain her thinking um, with the other kids. Ashaya is one of those talkers that you love to have because she is quite um, confident in her thinking. She does a lot of processing aloud, I notice um, as I watch the video. Um, next to her is Mariah, and Mariah is the quiet person in the group who is the one who um, um, we have to work hard to get her into the conversation, but when she comes in, she she's, uh, has things to join in and, and add um, as well. And then Brandon, who is uh, on my immediate right, and Brandon is, again, a very strong thinker, a strong um, uh, person who you know, comes in and works um, with, with all the other kids in the group. One of the things that this group was working on, though, was how to be a group. Um, again, they are a group of kids who, um, um, you, uh, if you saw in our, um, in our first um, uh, webinar, when we talked about what it looks like to have uh, kids thinking about um, collaboration goals. This was the group that I um, show video of and these are kids who think that if we, whoever talks and whoever is talking the loudest at the end gets to be the person who then shares their thinking. So one of the things we were working on was how to be together as a group. Um, some of the things that they did to understand nonfiction in the week that I worked with them beforehand, I took lots of notes because one of the things we want to do during guided reading is have um, a sheet in front of us that allows us to record down information that we're noticing about the kids. So one of the things I was noticing was that, you know, these are kids that really use photographs to help them get interested in the topics. They're using nonfiction features such as labels and captions to help us think more about the photos. They put the photographs and the words together. Um, all of these are things that are approximating, but I want to notice and name the things that they're trying out and doing. Um, they think a lot about background knowledge and as a group, I think their background knowledge tends to override some of the things that they're reading in the text. And so one of the things that we were doing a lot more work on was um, finding information in the book to support our thinking. So they're kids that are solidly in this um, Fluent Plus level. Um, and so these are some of the behaviors that we're working on. I have those behaviors kind of sorted in my head that there's text decoder work that they're doing. So these are kids that are very strong decoders. They can work their way through these um, multisyllabic words as well as words that are using different letter clusters and compounds. And they read fluently and you know, are, are approximating as they adjust for text type. Um, some of their meaning making abilities, you know, they are kids that, you know, use a range and variety of different text features and different um, um, strategies to make sense of the text. One of the things that we were working on was using text features to help us to organize our, our thinking and the ideas that we're getting from the text, like learning to use the heading um, to help us think about what we're going to be reading. Um, and the kids are working through, again, to extract and discuss information by integrating the text and the visuals. One of the things that I notice here is that sometimes the text language is not registering to them, though, the language that shows those that relationship between and among big ideas. You'll, you're going to see some of that in the clip. Um, and they're really strong um, in some places about justifying their opinions by referring to text evidence. So the text they're reading is a book called Amazing Salamanders. It's at level N, and this is a really, really cool book. The kids absolutely love this text, and um, they're learning things like where are sal what are salamanders, what are, where do salamanders live. So this is a report about salamanders. And so one of the things that we do is we spend some time examining the contents page just to help us to think about what we're going to be learning in there. Again, beginning to organize our thinking and noticing um, you know, what kind of information we're going to be reading about. And this is the page that you will see the kids as they're reading in the text. 
they are um, or discussing in the in the video, I should say. And one of the things that they're doing is thinking a lot about the different ways that salamanders get oxygen. And so this puts a little bit of a challenge in here um, with, within the reading. But let's go in and let's take a look at what these kiddos are doing as they are reading and thinking and talking together. So I'm going to show you the introduction. We'll pause and think about what we're noticing there. I'll show you the reading and discussing uh, a portion of that. And then I'll show you the closure of the lesson. So here is the introduction to Amazing Salamanders. Last time we were together, we were talking about how we wanted to make sure that we thought about how we wanted to say things really clearly before we started talking about yes. them. And without saying too much, because sometimes we were trying to, tending to say too long, too, mm -hmm. too much, too long. Um, one of the things I want you to think about today, I was noticing last week, sometimes we both start, you know, different people will start talking at the same time. Yeah. And what are some of the things that you can do that are considerate of the group when that happens? I'll stop and, like, decide which one's going to go talk first. How are you going to decide that, do you think? Mm. What could you think of that? Um, maybe let somebody else talk if they want. And once they finish, maybe one of them could talk. And if somebody else talks, you might you could maybe let them or they can maybe let you. Mm -hmm. So that taking turns, what were you going to add, Zayden? Um, I was, um, I want, just wanted to say, um, I mean, yeah, I wanted to add, you can stop and decide which one, but it's, you just have to like, let one person go at a time, so mm -hmm. it, it doesn't make like, so you got, so you don't have to like fight over it. You you just um, let let them go. How would you invite the other person to start to speak? Like if both two people are speaking, and you're going to wait, how would you invite the other person you would say, to take would the you, turn? Would you like to? Would you like to have a turn? Yeah. So just kind of offer. Can say he can go first. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. So we'll just practice that today. So as we go along, because my guess is we may have two people talking at the same time sometimes, because that happens in every conversation. And so you guys can just try that out. That, it, it does, it, it's always going to happen. It's it, just normal. No matter what. It? Yeah, it's just normal. Yeah. yeah. So this is one of those things you can use in other conversations, too. Yeah. So we have a book about salamanders called Amazing Salamanders. Um, salamanders. You do? You already know some things about salamanders? Yeah. What are I'll, things that you already one know? One thing I know about them is that they are poisonous. Uh -huh. Ah. So basically, their stomach are, is poisonous, um, but at first, their stomach is not poisonous. Mm -hmm. They actually tr change it into like an orangish reddish color, and then it like comes out of their, because um, they're like skin, pieces of your skin that aren't like all, all connected. Okay. So, so we'll it, see if like, we find out. We'll see if we find that out. So you're doing exactly what you need to do. Go ahead and start introducing that book to yourself. Take a look through, see what you see and what you notice. And it's a new book, so you're gonna have to push the uh, or, uh, press the pages down a little bit. Yeah, make it stay open. What are you noticing as you start looking through there? I saw tigers. and still live here today like this one. Uh-huh. All right. Long list. So yeah, see, I, look, it says dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that much about um, salamanders. What are you already figuring out? Um, that there are different types, like a tiger salamander, a, a climbing salamander, and a red salamander. Oh. What did you start noticing in there, Ryan? Um, That's 
a lot of salamanders. Only the five species. I can see them. Is growing in new town. What's the salamander doing? It's growing in new town. Wow. Look right here. Okay. Cool. So look at how you're figuring all this out. What do you notice, Signature? Um, and that there's all types of salamanders, and there's a blind salamander and a longbill salamander. Wasn't that helpful that the author put those labels yeah. in for us? Wow. I don't even never know what what their um Call name was. Me either. And wow. the predators are snakes, owls, and turtles. So and take a moment and read down the table of contents and I, think about. I did that the, at the first. Did you? Okay. Story. Just look again and think about what kinds of information are we going to be learning about salamanders. What did you notice? Like she got a big smile on your face. Um, that people that they that what they stay safe by using their poison, hunting, hiding, and tricky tales. Ooh. So you notice the chapter has a question, and then there's some other words under it that help to answer that. Interesting. Is that chapter five? It's about how send them, how do send them salamanders, salamanders. Uh -huh. grow and change by laying eggs, hatching, growing, and changing breeding. Oh. Um, uh, also, um, how um, on how salamanders stay safe? Um, there there are three different ways, and tricky tale. Uh -huh. It's basically um, like. They're the lizard. They're lizards, mm -hmm. so their tail can come off without any damage on their body. Does yeah, that connect hurt. to that idea, Mariah, that you were seeing? Uh -huh. Yes, uh -huh. like the picture that was like he, like the um, salamander was growing a tail. Yeah, I see that one because yesterday when I was in my. So I'll pause us right there and take us on to thinking about some of the things that we noticed uh, in that introduction. Um, so. Again, if I were with you, this would be your time to turn and talk. So if you're going to use this in any professional development, feel free to pause us and have people turn and have conversation after each of the video clips. Um, some of the things, though, that pop out to me as I watch that, that the students are doing, um, one is they were very effective at offering suggestions on how to collaborate, um, really making sure that, um, you know, helping them to articulate some of the ways they can go about this work because this was this was a huge challenge for this group was how to figure out how to get um, get their voices in and there was a little competition sometimes going on um, uh, among the students um, and then the other thing that always strikes me is how enthusiastic about nonfiction they are and that they just immediately began to introduce that book to themselves as they um, as I gave the book out um, you may have noticed I don't have a copy of guided, of a book in guided reading um, one of the things that um, I remember from a professional development with Margaret Mooney, um, she said that if you have a book, you will look at the book. If you don't have a book, you will look at the students. And that's always stuck with me in the back of my mind that I tend to notice their faces. So it gives me opportunity to uh, notice the expressions that are, that are going across their face because I'm not looking at a book. Um, these kids are really powerful at talking about their background knowledge. You know, they pull in information, they make comparisons, they, you know, pull in those kinds of things that, that uh, interest them. And they really do respond well to the photographs and other graphics and text features as they're engaging with the text. Um, my work in the beginning, obviously, was setting up that talk and collaboration work for them to support that stronger conversation. Because if guided reading is a time for us to have a collaborative conversation, one of the things I have to do is make sure that that collaboration um, is pow as powerful as it can be. Um, with this group, I have to make sure that more voices come into the conversation. It's easy for some of the kids to become those dominators in the conversation. And I just have to make sure that I'm facilitating in a way that ensures that voices like Mariah um, are kept in the conversation. Um, and I do that through using broad questions to initiate, but I also, um, uh, probe their thinking and, and invite them in. And then one of the things that I always try and do as well is acknowledge things that they're talking about, but not confirm or answer questions and fall into that um, kind of me ask a question, they give me an answer or they answer, they give a question and I give an answer. We want to just 
have that as some thinking that we're working on together. Um, in this particular lesson, I chose not to set the reading focus yet. I wanted to wait until we got over to reading the chapters. So you're going to see that um, the reading focus occurring during the um, uh, that reading that we do um, a little bit later. Um, one of the other things that I try and think about is helping to help them see what kinds of things that they're already doing in the work. And so that's one of my facilitative roles. So let's go in and let's talk a little bit or watch them as, as um, uh, excuse me, and watch them as they are reading and discussing. So I'm going to move us over a little bit farther into the lesson and we'll see some of the, um, uh, the work that the kids are doing here as a as a group. I have one question before we start. What's your question, Asha? Who is that where's Shia? Oh, Shia. Oh, let's turn over to chapter Heaven. one, to where it starts Heaven. chapter Heaven. one. Heaven. That's that's one of those words because it, it's a very tricky word there, isn't it? So thanks for asking about that. Heaven. Yeah, and how did you guys say it? Amphibians. Amphibians. Yeah. Amphibians. 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 And it's a tricky one to say. Yeah. P H stands for an F. Mm -hmm. But it it's not spelled like mm -hmm. F like and amphibians. Like so, and L and L. so turn over till you see the end of chapter one, so you'll know how far you're going to read to. Um, I'm going to read till. Okay. okay. So you're Ten. going to you're going to have a read here and Number. think about. Now this one is asking us a question. It's a really big thing. What yeah. are salamanders? What are salamanders? So our, our thinking work is to try and figure that out from this chapter. Put this, put the information you find here with your own thinking and figure out, how would you say that? What are salamanders? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, before you even start to read, take a look at the photographs. Mm -hmm. What can those add to your thinking? What can you tell even before you start? That, that um, one's that's big, fatter than that one. <laughs> that, that one is, well, um, in this... On this one, in the introduction, it said, um, what was it? Yeah, right here. Some are smaller than your little finger, and some are bigger than a person. Ooh. Ooh. So what are you thinking, Mariah, when you heard I that? Think, I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking that this one is maybe one of those ones. Never mind. It's kind of hard to so tell. they can eat humans? <laughs> no, they don't eat humans. Amphibians let's see, are... Let's see what they, what they do eat. So have a read through chapter one. See how the photographs are already getting your thinking going? Yeah. So the cool thing is here that this is some salamanders do not have lungs or gills. They breathe through their... Just, they breathe and oxygen through their skin. And I think that's cool because I've never heard of that. Oh, interesting. And I wonder how they can do that, though. Do they all do that? No, no. it says some. Just some of them do, okay. Yeah, but I wonder how they can do that. Because, you know what's weird? Their, their skin is probably like really thin. <laughs> like fat, like you can breathe through. Maybe, mm. just maybe, um, Wait, wait, wait. Oh yeah, that's you know what's weird? They have gills, but they don't use them. No, it's no. I mean, like right here. What? What are no, those? No, it says they have some blind salamanders, such as blind salamanders, have both lungs and gills. Most of the time, they use their gills to breathe. We were talking about how these different um, salamanders get oxygen. And we talked about that some of them have lungs and some have gills. So some of them have none. none they is, just breathe. And how do they get skin. through their yeah. skin? Mm -hmm. What was I, the other? How many ways were there? Um, there were only three, 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 three. three. Okay, can you go back in and see how you figured that out? I figured that out from it's page nine. From right here. Okay. I, I, when you read I, it, I, um, I like the black, the picture of the blind salamander <laughs> because <clears throat> it looks like it's glowing. Because it, it's like it kind of looks like it's glowing and mm -hmm. it's kind of like invisible. And like, it's, and like the, the the like the legs are like so skinny. Well, I kind like, of before huh? I saw before I read this, I kind of thought that this was a glowing salamander. I so, thought it was 
Um, I like it because it has armpit hair. I thought. I thought that's kind of like that's it's interesting, there, isn't it? I thought it had, I thought it was like a ghost. So, so no. let me bring you back to this thinking that you were already doing. Does how does the blind salamander get its oxygen? The blind it's, salamander gets its oxygen from, from both so basically lungs and gills. They both breathe lungs and and they, some don't breathe through that. They I just would, breathe through their skin because they're poor. Uh, I think they're blind. So let's go back into the text here and just have a quick read here. Can you go in and see where it tells you how many different ways that salamanders um, breathe and get their oxygen? Right here in this tiny uh, area. No, so can you here. come back over onto page 8? Let me direct you back over to page 8. It is the same. Okay, come back to page 8. Oh. And I want you to skim back down and see where does it tell you how many different ways um, that salamanders I, do this. Oh, I found it. Uh, it actually um, says four. It, it says, says there, there are, are four, four different, different ways that salamanders do this. So let's think, what are the four ways? Um, breathing through lungs, um, lungs gills, gills, gills um, skin, skin, mouth. Uh, no. And what's and the mouth. fourth one? What if they're mouth? Go in and find it. What's the fourth Lungs. one? Lungs. 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 So I'll pause this right there and to take us on into thinking about what those kids were doing as they were reading and discussing this text. So one of the things I always think is so um, interesting to watch this group is they have such a variety of strategies. You know, they, they really pull on their background of the topic. Um, to interpret the photographs. They're using labels and all of that kind of information to interpret the photographs. Um, Ashaya, one of the things I notice in this is, you know, I'm trying to get them to read, but we're trying to think about how many different ways. And she goes back to the table of contents because she remembered that on the table of contents, there were other chapters that gave us a list of the different ways they were doing different things like protecting themselves and so on. So she went back to use that as a strategy um, as well. And the, um, you know, they ask questions about unknown words and they, you know, are using text again from different places in the book. Um, they are attempting to ground their thinking in the text, but sometimes that, um, that background and their interpretations are overriding what the text says. And it's, it's just an interesting thing because these are kids who think really big, but sometimes we do have to make sure that they're registering what's happening within the text um, itself. And so when they said, oh yeah, there's three ways, you know, one of the things that clicked to me was, oh, it doesn't actually say that. It says there are four ways, but that language did not register to them as, as they were reading it. Um, in this, you see we're using what we would call a talk, read, reflect model. So we talked about the photographs. Um, we talked, looked at the headings, looked at different elements, text features um, a little bit, and then they read the text and then we reflected on what they found out. So we're using that model to work our way um, through the text. Um, I, my role is asking broad and probing questions like, what did you find out? How did you figure that out? Say more about that, those kinds of probes and recognizing like when the discussion begins to override what the text says, because that's one of the things that starts to happen is these kids were, have so much background knowledge and they use the photographs really well, so they tend to start to move away from the text. So I have to bring them back to some of that literal uh, information that they're overlooking. You know, nudging them to reread to find specific information is one of the roles that I would play in that as I'm listening to what they're saying and you know setting up that focus so that when they begin to read that whole notion of integrating the ideas and um, you know calling out what that thinking work is that they're going to be doing like integrating ideas generated by the photographs with words with the um, the actual running uh, words that we say. So that's that reading and discuss, discussing portion. What we would do as a teacher is we would read as much of that as our time allowed. We're going to talk a little bit about timing here in just a moment after we see the closure. So let me take you to the closure of that lesson and let's think about some of the things that we're seeing as the kids are um, engaging in, in uh, the, the closure and the wrap-up of this particular day. So let's talk for a moment about things that you were doing today as readers. So one of the things that happens sometimes when we start reading 
is we absolutely start noticing all the photographs and all the things that our author's doing. You use the, the um, labels that our author gave us to help us figure out what some of the photographs were about. Mm -hmm. And you even began thinking, why would they call this one a tiger salamander? You use the photograph to help you make those, um, those and, get those ideas yeah. um, out there. One of the hardest things when you're sometimes reading about a very exciting topic like this is we start getting so many questions and ideas and everything starts getting bubbling up that we sometimes forget what it actually says in the reading and that's one of the things that we have we're going to think a little bit more about tomorrow is just making sure that we're getting the information from the book that's there and that we're putting that with our thinking okay mm -hmm. so that's what we'll work on tomorrow we're going to read chapter two and maybe even three and four as we get into our book tomorrow. Maybe okay. we'll finish now, how did you do today? Because one of the things you were doing was working on being considerate of other people when they were all having ideas at the same time and we were going to let other people get their thinking in. How do you think we did today, Mariah? Good, but when sometimes when someone was talking, they joined and then they stopped. I oh, think that we so you did. noticed some people waiting when other people were talking? Uh -huh. I think that we did good, but like, as Mariah said, like, kind of like when Aisha and Zeta were talking to each other, um, they both stopped and they didn't let Aisha go first. Uh -huh. All right, so let's go into our uh, thinking about what uh, we were noticing the kids doing in the closure. So uh, this is one of those times when I'm doing a little bit more talking than they are, um, but I want to give them the opportunity to notice. So you'll see they they were very attentive as I was, you know, talking with them about some of the things that they were thinking. Um, and one of the things that I noticed myself doing in in that uh, closure as well is I nor I work to normalize some of the things that they are doing already. So it's kind of helping them to see that even if it's a challenge. That's something that happens to readers all the time. Um, and like uh, noticing the work, the thinking work that they did, as well as those challenges and phrasing it again as a normal challenge. This is what happens to readers, not good readers or bad readers, but all readers. We all struggle sometimes that the background that we have, um, the excitement about the topic that can override some of the things that we're reading. Um, one of the other things that I, I try and do in that, in this lesson, um, because the focus had been the same from the previous week on our talk work together um, was I ask them to notice the thinking and behaviors of others in the group and ask them to notice and name the collaborative work that they were doing. So rather than me naming it, um, asking them if they were noticing any of that. And then especially helping, you know, again, Mariah come into that conversation because that's one of those kinds of uh, things. She's, she's very easily overridden by the other kids and I want to make sure that she gets an opportunity to share um, thinking and noticing as well. Um, so within the guided reading structure um, and thinking about that, um, how the portioning out of time, because people always ask about, you know, how long is an introduction? How long is a guided reading lesson? So guided reading lesson is going to be 20 to 25 minutes when you're with kids in these reading stages. Um, these fluent stages. So the introduction is going to be anywhere from five to eight minutes. Um, the reading and discussing around 10 to 12. So as the, you know, as we're going through with this talk, read, reflect, we'll have to think about how many um, chunks, if you will, of the text that we'll be able to read in that time. And then making sure that that closure comes in, that's a minute or two when we just reflect on what went on. Now, that's a single lesson. But one of the things that starts to happen when you're in these longer texts is it takes multiple days for us to be able to read the text. So one of the things to think about is that that first session is going to include an introduction, but the first session has to also include an introduction to the text overall. So in a nonfiction text, I'm going to give the kids an opportunity to look through the entire text to get a sense of the topic, noticing, um, you know, what you know, what the photographs are, how the book looks like it's organized, that sort of thing. We probably wouldn't do quite that introduction in fiction, um, but what we might do instead is have more of a conversation about what we know about how fiction texts work and the kinds of things that we notice. We would also examine the table of contents and help us to begin anticipating the storyline. So the introduction to the text overall and then coming back and introducing more specifically to today's reading portion. So on the first session, that may take around 10 minutes um, for us to do. Then there's 
you know, reading and discussing. So on this particular day, we may, you may feel like the introduction and the, the you know, going through the text and talking about it um, takes longer than the reading part. Um, and sometimes that, that happens on a, on a first session with a nonfiction text. We always wanna make sure that we include a closure. So anywhere from 20 to 22, three minutes here um, with that timing. Now on the subsequent sessions, what I wanna do is think about that I have to do a quick review of the previous session's ideas and then introduce today's reading work uh, or today's reading portion and the work that we'll do around it. And you'll notice the timing's about three minutes here. What you don't want to do on a subsequent session is to start with this question. What did we find out yesterday? What were we learning about yesterday? If I ask it as a question, we'll spend several minutes talking through yesterday. What we want to do as a teacher to, to make this introduction, you know, sort of short and tight is just do a quick review, say something like, you know, yesterday we we found out that there were four different ways that um, the um, uh, salamander is able to get oxygen. And so we might go back just a quick review with that and then introduce today's reading and then go on into that work. And so the reading and discussing of today's portion is gonna be longer than what that introduction is. So we're gonna get extra reading and discussing it on today. Now, one of the things that starts to happen is some children and some groups may begin reading portions of that text away from the teacher. And so that depends on the kids, it depends on the text. Um, but if we are gonna have kids to take that text away and do some of that reading on their own, then we have to prepare them for that. So it might be looking through a nonfiction text and thinking about in this next chapter or two, let's look at the headings, let's think about what some of the ideas might be that we're reading about so that we introduce that little text portion before they head off um, to do that reading. So they might do that reading at home, they might do that reading during independent reading time. You'll have to think about when your next session with the kids is and making sure that you're giving them enough time to get that reading um, done. Every lesson though is gonna end with a closure. So even if I'm sending them away to do some reading um, on their own, one of the things that I'm gonna do is to pause and think about what we did today. And so those are those kinds of things that I have to make sure every lesson has an introduction, some reading and discussing, and then a closure. And so that's the consistent um, work that's going to happen. Um, as a classroom teacher, you'll decide whether or not you're going to finish that text with guided reading. Um, sometimes we only use a portion of the text and then that's all we're gonna do with that text and the kids can decide if they wanna finish the book on their own or not. Um, and then you can decide, do you wanna have a meeting with them? Do they wanna have a meeting without you? Do, you know, do, are they all gonna finish the text or not? Cause sometimes, you know, you'll have texts that grab some kids and some texts that they decide that they don't wanna finish. Um, so you don't necessarily always finish a book and guided reading. But at any given time, there is a really specific role that the teacher's playing, I think, in these lessons, and that is of facilitating that conversation. So how does the teacher go about that? Well, I come back to this quote from Richard Allington and Rachel Gabriel, where they say that we have to make sure that we hold in our heads that conversations with peers improves comprehension and engagement with text. So I see that guided reading lesson as an opportunity for a conversation with peers. And so what I have to make sure is that I am not turning it into a, a question and answer or an interrogation. What we want is a conversation where the kids are able to focus on analyzing and commenting and comparing and thinking about what they've read. So to do that, what I have to do is shift my role into being that facilitator. So some of the prompts that um, I use to think, and I think of them as prompts for engaging thinkers, is the first thing is silence. One of the things that is the biggest challenge sometimes as a teacher is holding back and not talking and giving kids that space to think. So that's one of the things that we want to use as a teacher is the silence that um, we can, uh, can use. And one of the questions that I'm quite often using is what are you thinking? Because that gives kids a chance to explain what they think without me using my question to put information into their thoughts. 
Um, I think of this as a broad question. It's a question that doesn't have any information in it. It's not a text dependent question as much as it's a thinking dependent question. And so I wanna give kids the opportunity to explain what they think. And then I wanna probe. I wanna say, oh, tell us more about that. You know, invite them to expand on their thinking and saying something like, what makes you think that? So that I can figure out what in the text has led to their thinking or what in their life has led to that thinking. So oftentimes I'll say, you know, what makes you think that? And they begin to tell me about something from their life um, as opposed to something in the text. And so then I can say, um, you know, for example, if they say, well, I saw it in a movie, then I could say, what in the text got you thinking about that movie? So that I can link background knowledge to what in the text is prompting um, for that thinking. And one of the other things we want to do is make sure that kids are thinking about what other people are saying. So inviting kids to comment about other people's ideas in the group, you know, and what do you think about so-and-so's idea um, as we're going through. And this is that kind of facilitation that may feel a little bit different. So I want to have text dependent questions planned, but I don't want to launch with those. I want to use those as the kind of questions that bring us a little bit further into, um, into that text. But all the while, my role is listening. My role is listening for these different levels of understanding because I recognize that comprehension doesn't happen at one point. It's this process that's taking place. And so when kids are sharing their thinking, what I'm having to do is to think about, well, if they're giving me background knowledge, that's interpretive. They're, they're pulling in that background. They're thinking beyond the text. And so then I might ask them to, to talk about, well, you know, what in the text made you think that? so that I can get to some of that literal uh, information that's coming. Um, I, you know, one of the things you noticed was how we were commenting on how they were using the features in the text to think about that. So that takes them into that analytical thinking um, and, as well. But what I have to do as a teacher is really listen and notice and name for myself the levels of understanding that kids are, are demonstrating through their conversation. Um, at any given time, I've gotta be thinking about not doing for the child, what they're learning to do for themselves. And that's one of the, again, one of the, those really challenging things sometimes is holding back um, within the lesson and not providing all the answers for everything. So after they got a reading lesson, this is one of those questions that I get a lot is, you know, what happens after we read the book? Well, one of the things I wanna do is make sure that kids have the opportunity to reread the books on their own. So it's one of those books that becomes part of their independent reading collection. Um, and I wanna give them time to have conversations with other kids that have read this book so that they can extend and expand on their thinking um, as well. Then I wanna also think about, can I use this text as a launch for some writing that would extend thinking? So I look for the kinds of things um, like a copy provided here in their lesson plans with this um, book. Um, there's Amazing Salamanders and then the, the pair book to it, the fiction is called Salamander's Surprise. And one of the things is we're learning information in both of those texts. The fiction book actually uses some vocabulary and language and information about a salamander that we actually didn't read in the nonfiction text because it's talking about where, um, uh, where a pet salamander would live. And so one of the things that the kids would have to do is to put information between both books to complete the task that's here on the, the left, uh, designing a vivarium for the salamander's home. Now, as a teacher, what I'm always trying to think about is how can I um, leverage is I think a word that a lot of people use these days. How can I use that activity and leverage it on? So what I might decide to do is have the kids do some additional research as independent work and have them work with a partner and choose an animal that they want to do the research on, maybe create a visual describing their habitat. They may or may not label the, the visual. They may, um, we may want them to write about that an animal. We may take this over into some writing workshop that we're doing, but all of those kinds of writing um, pieces um, allow kids to extend their thinking around the text um, that they're um, that they've read. The text become a launch pad in a way. And one of the things that we want to do is really make sure that if we're using connected text, that we are planning a specific lesson that that supports kids to synthesize their thinking around the pair. So oh, copy materials are created in this way. There, there's always gonna be a nonfiction and a fiction text in these flying start materials that are connected around a key concept. 
So these two books are connected around the idea that salamanders are amphibians that have specific characteristics and that they have specific conditions in which they, where they survive. So after we had had, I think we had three sessions with amazing salamanders, and then we had two sessions with Salamander Surprise. Then we pulled the kids together for a, a specific lesson on thinking between the two books. So I'm gonna show you just a little snippet of that particular um, video as well. So we have been reading about salamanders for a couple, several days now. We read Amazing Salamanders. We read Salamander Surprise. And here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about all the things that you've learned about salamanders. Okay. Now, in your head, hold them in your head. Think, think, think. What are some things that you've learned about salamanders? So I want you to write down three facts that you remember from our books about salamanders. You can look back in the book if you want to. If you need to look back in the book, look back in the book. So talk with your partners about three things that you remember that you've learned about salamanders. Mm -hmm. The colorful one. I talked about that. Poisonous. So you two talk together. Oh, you two talk together. I'm going to whisper your voice. The ones that um, have different types of colors are poisonous. Um, some salamanders can live underwater when they're younger. So make sure you're getting ideas from you guys talk a little bit and then decide which three you're going to write down. Okay. Only three? Mm -hmm. You're only going to write down three things. What if we accidentally write more? Well, you're only going to write three. Just write three. Mm -hmm. Just three. So much A's in three salamander. Things. There's I a lot of A's in salamander, aren't there? I only have two A's in my Now make sure that you talk with your partner. Do you agree on what you're going to write down? There's only three A's. And D E R. What did you learn about salamanders from reading these books? Mm. They can really grow. They can really grow their body parts. I hear a talk. Uh -huh. They can. Um, the bright salamanders are really interesting. Make sure you get ideas from your partner. They, they can like grow their body parts. I could put a, 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 um, a period. They lay eggs above the water. The eggs turn the into egg, larvae. Comma the eggs turn into larva, comma, the, the larva, larva turn into, into adult, adults, adults comma, comma, then <laughs> they lay the eggs. Oh, now you, when you read it, you don't have to put the comma in, it just helps you know where to no, pause we your just, voice. No, we just wanted, we just wanted to. You just wanted to make sure you, people knew there was a comma yeah. there. Okay. Because if we, because we were saying four things. <laughs> you didn't want to run them together. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so you're giving us the stages yeah. of their life, their life <laughs> yes. cycle. Salamanders are poisonous. Remember that part we looked at about how they were poisonous. Why were they? Why were those bright colors? You think helpful to keep them safe? Well, because like huh? uh, sure these girls are the ones that brought this idea. Because I'm sure because we think that it can, like like you know how the sometimes fire like the alarm in the firefighter's place mm -hmm. and. It flashes bright red. So and how, that how does that crap. help us understand the how probably the color because there's a lot. Let her finish your thought, maybe you add in. Like probably you know what, what to, which one you choose that is poisonous. It's the bright ones because like you focus on the bright color. Oh. Or probably because there's like a lot of bright colors and they can like be camouflaged with the bright colors. Do you think that the animals recognize that they're poisonous by the color? Does that help? When they see that color, oh. they know, whoa, that's not a good salamander to eat because it's poisonous? Well, what do you think? I think all, all I think a lot of all salamanders are, um, are poisonous because um, I think all of them are because if they weren't poisonous, 
and it, they didn't grab him by the tail, mm -hmm. and they grabbed him by the head. How are they gonna? They can't lose their head. Did it? Did it tell us I, in here well, that I they're all poisonous, or just some of them are poisonous? I disagree because it had said that brightly colored salamanders are often poisonous. The bright colors warn predators to stay away from them. Does that so tell us they're the all off, poisonous? No, it says, off. It says it says often. Yeah. So like even if. A salamander is bright. That doesn't mean it's poisonous. But mm -hmm. if you know it says often, often means that sometimes. So yeah. yeah. Some some and of them. you might not want to touch any and salamanders it, um, that are bright. And this says use of poisonous. Mm -hmm. Many salamanders make poisonous to protect themselves from predators. Some salamanders have poisonous that comes from out of their um, back, uh, from their Flags. back. No, I, glads. Um, glads. Glads. I glads in their skin. The poison has a bad taste, so the predators to, that catch these salamanders will spit them out, keeping the salamanders So let's safe. think a little bit about what we notice the kids doing is they're working with partners to think and write together. Um, and one of the things, again, that I'm having them do is to jot their ideas um, uh, as that they're remembering. And I was very proud of myself that I did not hand the books to the students. I am put them on the table and I'm waiting for them to decide to go back into the text. It's one of those moments. I appreciate that I didn't uh, just hand the books out and say, now remember everybody look back. I gave them that opportunity to make that decision for themselves. And I was really excited to see them learning to use the book to locate ideas um, and find that evidence to support their thinking. Um, and then really noticing and naming, I didn't show all the way through, but one of the things that I do is notice a name when they go back into the text um, and seeing how they're using to uh, using the text to help them find that evidence um, and not just relying on interpreting and adding on to their um, to their own ideas but also noticing the ideas of others and beginning to agree and disagree as they're uh, in that text and noticing and listening to what the other kids are saying. So one of the things that my role again has to be is supporting them to get their full ideas out when they share because again this is a group of kids that tends to quite often you know not let someone finish their thought before they um, uh, begin to share their thinking and the role of connected text over time really gives kids an opportunity to develop greater comprehension on a topic develop a range of reading strategies as they read these different text types with different purposes and structures and features it increases their ability to think and talk about the topic from different perspectives um, as they see different ways that authors are thinking and, and talking about a text um, and the ideas. It's also going to support them to write in more authentic, authentic ways because if they don't know how to look at a text and start to notice the different ways that they can present their thinking, then that's going to be something that is always a challenge because what you know first is a what you know as a writer, you know first as a reader. Um, it also supports their language development to move from exploratory to presentational. It, it enables the students to think about what they think um, and work their way towards that meaning that they're constructing. And it also supports them to be able to begin to um, develop all the roles of readers. Um, we talked about um, Luke and Freebody's model in our first um, session, that noticing that they're, what work they're doing as text decoders, but also noticing as text participants and text users and text analysts, all the different roles of readers so that the kids can grow into that intellectual life that surrounds them, using text in a very powerful way as they read and write um, and think about the information um, that they're learning. Some of the questions, so a few questions have come through today. Um, one was thinking about assessment. Um, you know, what do you use for assessment with the kids at these reading stages? Um, I'm going to just actually refer you back to webinar number two because that was our, um, um, the webinar on assessment that, um, where we talked about that. And so you'll see some ideas about using writing and uh, student writing and looking at students um, through running records and through note taking um, within the lesson. So I want to refer you back to that because I know we're, we're running a little bit long on this one. Um, a couple of other questions. One was, um, what do we do when children are not moving at the same pace as others in the group? Um, this is one of those things that we know about guided reading grouping is that the kids are going to go in at different paces. And so you might find that you have kids that you move out of a group um, because they just suddenly that 
the other the other kids in the group seem to be supporting them for meaning making. Um, so if you have someone who leads everyone or someone who is um, being supported by everyone else, then we want to think about readjusting them and putting them into a different group. Um, if you're thinking also about the pace of reading within the lesson, one of the things that I do um, as I send kids off, or not off, but as I send them into the text to read a particular chapter, is I ask them to make eye contact with me when they finish reading, and then their role is to look back in the text and begin to prepare themselves for the conversation. I say to them, you know, make eye contact with me, then look back in the text and think about what you want to talk about, so that they're not just sitting there with their text and closed or turning their text over, because then that intimidates the ones around them who haven't finished. Um, in many cases, you can't really tell who has finished, so I have to watch and just make sure that, um, that everyone's um, uh, doing, having an opportunity to look back and think about what they've read. So that's, those are a couple of ways that I'll handle um, kids who are reading um, or not moving at the same pace. Um, one last question was, um, do they have to read all of the book? Um, and then the second part of that was, can I read, can they read that book at home or, or read it independently? So one of the things to think about is you use as much of that guided reading book in the guided reading lesson as you need for the work that you're supporting kids to do. So it may be that if they're in a fiction text, the challenge is in the first couple of chapters in the text, and that may be how much of that book that you use. Um, you can then decide, you know, if kids are really caught up in the book, they may want to read that book on their own, and you may plan a lesson, um, a plan to meet with them at a different time after several days, or they may decide to meet on their own without you to have conversations about how that book went. Um, in nonfiction, I'll just have to decide how much of that text that we want to read. Um, we don't necessarily have to finish every book in guided reading. When you're in these stages, kids may do some of that reading away from the teacher. So um, if you feel confident that those readers can hold on to that text and, and the ideas that they're reading about, um, you may want to use some type of a, an organizer to help them jot some of their ideas down. So Whereas in the guided reading lesson, I will orally say to them, think about what you want to talk about. I might, for some kids, give them some type of a graphic um, that's set up maybe by chapter and say, when you re finish reading this chapter, jot down two or three ideas that you think we should talk about when you come back to the lesson. So I can use a graphic organizer in that way to help them to hold on to some of that thinking um, that they do. I will do that with different kids with different texts. So it's not a blanket that we will do any of this, but these are all options that teachers have as they put guided reading lessons together um, and think about how their classroom runs. So we've got one more webinar. Um, our webinar tomorrow is going to look at advanced readers. Um, the kids that we'll see in the videos are fifth graders, so we'll talk about what the guided reading work looks like when kids have moved into this very advanced stage of reading development. So I hope you can join me on that session. Um, thank you again so much for coming uh, to the session today or um, reading through. Please feel free to send any information on future webinars that you'd like to pat, um, and if you have additional questions, feel free to email me as well. Thanks for joining us today.